it's been a heck of a year and um, I'm really glad that the volunteer program with City of Austin is, is still going strong. I'm looking at all the, the names and faces on my screen right now and that's great. That's just wonderful. And um, before I start, I really want to thank City of Austin volunteers. Uh, I've worked with City of Austin staff for uh, on various projects for off and on for 20 years. And um, I can say firsthand, um, I'm married to a City of Austin volunteer. I've been a City of Austin volunteer and uh, they've helped us with countless uh, efforts that um, they, they are what makes the wheel go round. So y'all deserve a, a big round of applause virtually. As was mentioned, I am Director of Conservation with San Antonio Zoo Center for Conservation and Research. And this is a really cool program. So full disclosure, I've never been a zoo guy. Uh, and I've got asked that question a million times because my undergraduate and my graduate degrees were both in zoology. The first thing someone asked you at a cocktail party is, oh, so you're gonna work in a zoo? And I would think to myself, no, never. Um, but here I am and I love it. And part of the reason why I love it is that the center is, is basically a freestanding entity. So I don't deal with exhibit animals. We never touch cotton candy. Um, what we do is we focus on conservation and fundamental research needs of the highest priority. And in addition to high priority, high conservation need, we try to um, select projects and programs that we can um, play to our strengths. So I'm very fortunate that I have excellent staff. We have great infrastructure. We have world-class vets you know, 100 feet from my building. And uh, we're also in San Antonio. So as my, my history might tell you, um, I'm still obsessed with groundwater salamanders. And we have more and more all the time to uh, be concerned about and to do research on. And being in San Antonio, living in Wimberley, is a perfect place for a kid like me. So this project, the Horned Lizard Reintroduction Project, um, it started uh, in 2017. Um, we got kind of a slow start. You know, you have to build these things from scratch. Um, but one of my main reasons for starting this um, right when I got to the zoo was really the, the seven years I spent with the state. It's a state reptile amphibian guy. I heard a thousand times constantly uh, when talking to members of the public, what's going on with horned lizards? When are you bringing them back? Can I get some, et cetera. And um, I knew from that experience that in the hearts and minds of Texans, the, the demise of the horned lizard throughout much of its range is the single greatest herpetological conservation issue. So um, of course, some people would say, <laughs> no, no conservation for reptiles, amphibians, but um, uh, most, most Texans would beg to disagree when it comes to uh, horned lizards. And <clears throat> so I mentioned in the last slide there that there's been a, uh, a decline in horned lizards throughout part of their range. If you look at this map from my naturalist, the pink blob is their historic range. And the orange squares uh, correspond to quadrants where they have been found recently. There are photos documenting them and they're, they're in the iNaturalist database. And so if you look closely um, at Texas, well, there are very, very few sightings from the eastern third of the state. And that corresponds with the declines that we've observed oh, over the last 50 years. So there are plenty of historical records um, for East Texas, even including Northern Louisiana, as you can see there, um, but they're just not there anymore. And that, that dead zone uh, extends um, well west of the I-35 corridor. So if you look, you know, uh, down around Houston, there are a couple of blobs there on, on the bend. Um, they used to be really abundant in Houston. I meet people all the time who tell me stories of playing with them in their yard in Houston. Well, good luck finding them there now. So they've disappeared from a third of the state. It just so happens to be that that one third of the state, including the urban corridor, is where the vast majority of Texans live, which means most of the people who have fond memories of abundant horned lizards uh, in their youth um, have, 
have lost horned lizards in their uh, area. And, um, you know, for people my age and older, uh, we have those memories of abundant horned lizards. Uh, for folks uh, of the younger generations, like this boy here, um, half the time they don't even believe, you know, their grandparents when they tell them stories about, you know, collecting horned lizards in the yard and they were so abundant and really cute and you can find them everywhere. This is as close as most young Texans are ever going to get to seeing a live horny lizard. A horny, horn, horny toad, horned lizard. Okay, let me take that moment um, to, uh, to explain something. I also get asked a lot, what's the correct name for them? What should I be calling them? And um, I always say, well, Phrynosoma cornutum. Um, but that's kind of a mouthful, and that's kind of a geeky name for them, their scientific name. Um, the common name is officially Texas Horned Lizard. Folks who went to TCU would argue that it's the uh, horny frogs. Um, most folks in Texas call them horny toads. And frankly, I don't care what you call them as long as you love them. Um, the fact that this species uh, has been given so many terms of endearment as so many sweet nicknames, once again, just points to how much Texans love this lizard. Um, I can't think of any other reptile that enjoys so many nicknames in terms of endearment as the Texas horned lizard. And that love of the species um, is in part why um, horned lizards were put on the state threatened species list and indeed why it remains there today. So in the hearts and minds of, of most Texans, um, the absence of horny horny toads, horned frogs, horned lizards, it's deeply felt. Um, people miss that lizard um, because of its charisma and how um, approachable uh, horned lizards are, and they're gone now. So a little bit about the um, what led up to us starting this project. About uh, 15 years ago, Parks and Wildlife funded Dr. Dean Williams at TCU, appropriate enough. He's a, a horned lizard geneticist, and he conducted statewide jack surveys of lizards. So he and his students went out and collected lizards and swabbed their cloacas to get DNA. He sent out sampling kits to volunteers and other researchers around the state. And the mission was to swab as many uh, horned lizards in their natural environment as possible. And so with that data set, he was able to go through <clears throat> and an analyze the relationships of, of horned lizards from different parts of the state based on their genetics. And what he found was really interesting. He found that there's a, a northern group um, from the panhandle south to some point, and uh, I'll get into that in a minute, a southern group, uh, which basically goes from the Rio Grande north to some point, and then out in far west Texas, there's a third genetic group. That was really good information um, for those of us who are current, concerned with horned lizard conservation and taking direct action to, to help the species. Namely, um, uh, state uh, biologists like myself, um, some academics, and um, folks with zoos. So around the time that Dean released his, uh, the results of his study, um, the Texas Horned Lizard Conservation Coalition was formed. And that's made up primarily of, uh, at that time it was Fort Worth Zoo and Dallas Zoo, TPWD, uh, TCU of course, and uh, a few other groups. And now of course includes um, San Antonio Zoo. And that was a, an opportunity for uh, researchers to get together and talk about what they know and what they don't know and come up with ideas for how to help horned lizards in, in the best way possible. So when um, Dean's report came out and the Texas Horned Lizard Conservation Coalition got together, um, the first thing that, that we said was, well, now we have the information we need to know to take this big step and start captive breeding lizards to reintroduce them to the wild because within each of those three large areas, those three genetic groups, there wasn't a whole lot of genetic structure, which means 
you could take lizards from one area in South Texas or their offspring and turn them loose in another area within South Texas or within North Texas, and you're not messing up the, the existing genetic structure, which is a, a major concern, right? We don't want to um, lose what we already what we have, and so <clears throat> that was really uh, important information um, for those uh, zoos, Fort Worth and Dallas at the time, who wanted to start on these reintroductions because it meant it's possible that they're not just these little distinct populations and you can't ever mix them. Um, a few years after that, uh, folks at Texas Parks and Wildlife in their landscape ecology program developed what's called the Teams tool. And so this is a super powerful um, uh, tool for <clears throat> remote assessments. And, and basically the aspect of the tool that, that I use is uh, Amy Truer Kuhn conducted statewide vegetation surveys to ground truth a, um, a model of plant communities statewide. So she came up using um, satellite imagery, a, uh, a very high resolution map of plant communities, um, basically something like 15 meter resolution, and then went out and ground truth that to confirm and to fine tune her tool so that now we have a really detailed map of, of vegetation throughout the entire state. On top of that, um, there was a, uh, a program using the team's tools where we were species experts were asked to come up with between eight and a dozen species for each ecoregion that were mappable. So none of my beloved salamanders would make that list because you can't see what's in a cave from a satellite. But um, horned lizards um, are a high priority species statewide and uh, they're, they're pretty much um, specialists on, on certain habitats. And so it's a perfect species to um, include in this analysis. And the result of that was basically um, to develop a, um, um, a horned lizard map that would say um, on a scale of one to five, whether you would expect to see a horned lizard in that particular habitat associated with that plant community. So um, another project that, um, that I was fortunate to help start uh, while I was with Parks and Wildlife was the Herps of Texas project on iNaturalist. And hopefully all of you are intimately familiar with iNaturalist, but it's a citizen science platform where you can um, upload photos that you've taken in the wild of any species. Of course, this one was reptiles and amphibians. <clears throat> and um, they pulled the metadata from your photo and then the photos curated and and people help confirm the identification. And so historically, you know, these databases like the Natural Heritage Project and museum databases, they're dependent on either dead animals in jars that might have been collected 75 years ago or um, notes um, submitted by a consultant, which never happens. Um, and this was just an explosion in, in data acquisition and that any person with a smartphone in their pocket could make a real contribution to our understanding of the distribution and diversity of, of organisms in Texas. And so we use that tool uh, extensively to look at where horned lizards are now. Where are people seeing horned lizards, photographing them and uploading it? And that's very telling. That, um, that very first map that I showed you, those old boxes were all iNaturalist records um, that's where people find horned lizards now. So that's a really powerful tool. And then um, for my own program at, at San Antonio Zoo, um, really some of the, the best information that we had starting with came from uh, what was learned in previous efforts by Fort Worth Zoo and Dallas Zoo. And uh, we learned to follow uh, those things that they found successful. And we also learned to avoid the things that didn't work for them. So we're really fortunate that um, there were other um, uh, pathfinders ahead of us um, to help us really hit the, hit the ground running uh, with our own program and not repeat the same mistakes or overlook some of the things that really work. So our approach um, was to establish what I like to call lizard factory. And that name 
really refers to the fact that the goal of our captive breeding program is to churn out large numbers of captive born offspring. So if you think about other reintroduction or stalking efforts with say game species, um, nobody turns loose a dozen trout fingerlings. People don't turn loose five turkeys. They do it in large numbers. One, because there's really high attrition, especially with young animals, say trout fingerlings. And um, also you want to jumpstart that population so that individuals that do survive to reproductive age, there are enough of them on the landscape to find each other. And so that was our approach. And uh, I did a bit of genetic calculations and just back of the envelope guesses at uh, mortality rates. And then I confirmed that with, uh, with Dean Williams, who's actually a horned lizard geneticist. And uh, amazingly, our, our guesstimates at how many lizards we needed to turn loose were pretty much um, the same. Um, and that's 100 individuals. So in addition, um, the breeding, the, the captive breeding population, those adults that we've collected from the wild, they also need, we need about 100 individuals to be able to um, make enough baby lizards and also to make sure that the genetic diversity of those babies is, is high enough that they're gonna have a good chance in the wild. So I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the great infrastructure that we have at the zoo, everything we do is in a laboratory environment. So it's completely climate controlled. We control the temperature, the day length, um, what time of day it gets hot, et cetera, et cetera. And by doing that, um, we really take the um, accidents out of the equation. Things like tonight where it's 30 degrees, you know, they pop up in, in odd times in the wild. And that can be really hard uh, on, on captive lizards, say in an outdoor enclosure. Um, the, the real benefit to, to doing it in a laboratory is that because everything is climate controlled, we can control not just their conditions on a day-to-day -day basis, but we can control the seasons. And so what we've set out to do, but actually we're doing it right now, is that we start shortening the day length and cooling down the temperatures on our adults a month or month and a half before that would happen in the wild. And the idea is to trick them into hibernating a bit earlier so that we can bring them up earlier in the springtime than, than their wild cousins would, would be getting active and, um, and get them to start doing what adult lizards in good condition do, which is breed. So by early hibern having early hibernation, early breeding, we hope to get early egg laying on a predictable schedule every year, which means early hatchlings. That's really good because hatchling horned lizards, I'll show you pictures in a minute, they are tiny and they are defenseless. I call them nature's popcorn, right? Everything can eat them. So large spiders, mice, the usual suspects like birds and snakes and, and other animals. Um, by having them hatch out earlier in the year and then taking great care of them uh, for the following months, uh, we're able to get them to a, a pretty large size before they're released. And so they're, they're really on the edge of that danger zone uh, by the time we release them. They're, um, they're less susceptible to every sort of predation. And importantly, um, they're big enough to actually eat harvest ants and, and a wider range of prey, um, which means they're gonna have a better time as predators themselves. So um, by turning them loose at a larger size, they're able, able to take advantage of that full menu of prey species on the landscape. When they're really tiny, they can't even eat harvest ants. They have to eat very small things. And um, having done that, uh, we conduct, well, we conduct our first release uh, back in October, but in general, um, we're gonna try and, and move it up a bit and try and get them out there in, in late summer or early fall so that they have um, more of a season before they go down for their first winter. And, um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can I interrupt? Just ask a question real quick that relates to that survivability that we have in the sure. chat. Um, so Ruth and Jim have a question about like what killed off the horned lizards in the first place. Can you that is a great, finance? 
That is a great question. And uh, I kind of skipped over that in my historical introduction. Um, everybody blames fire ants. And fire ants are not uh, undeserved of blame. Uh, fire ants are a menace. However, um, fire ants arrived after the declines began. And uh, if you mapped out sort of the, the timeline of fire ants spreading across the state, it doesn't really mesh up very well with the, with the spread of decline in horned lizards. Uh, they're bad for horned lizards. And they're one of the main reasons um, why horned lizards don't recruit very well in most places because the babies just can't get started if there are too many fire ants. But um, there are other things that are uh, often overlooked um, and things that occurred in the distant past. Uh, so we, we won't even see them now if we look for them. I'll give you an example. Um, about 60 years ago, 60 or 70 years ago, um, Manufacturers and and um, and supply uh, suppliers started pushing uh, a new product called DDT, and you could buy this in a granular form in 50-pound sacks at the feed store, and um, folks would use it to treat harvest ants. Now, I'm not that old. I'm not a native Texan, but I can't imagine what Paradise, Texas, must have been that hardworking, frugal farmers and ranchers saw harvest ants as such a menace that they would go to the bother of buying poison to hand apply on the mounds, but they did. And um, harvest ants, uh, anecdotally at least, declined um, throughout large areas, um, in, in part due to pesticides and there's some other factors. The difference is, is that harvest ants in their life history they send up hundreds of reproductive males and females after warm rains, like in spring and summer. And those mated queens, they can start colonies a kilometer away or more from where they started. Horned lizards, they have to walk there on inch long legs. So if there isn't suitable habitat next door, they're not gonna get there. And of course, harvest ants are, are once again abundant in a lot of areas where, where they were rare, um, but they can fly to those spots. Um, horned lizards couldn't wait the 50 years, you know, 35 years uh, between when horned lizard or harvest ants might have disappeared in an area to when they came back, right? They have to eat a few hundred a day. So um, it's that difference in life history that, that explains why we have harvester ants in so many areas, but the horned lizards haven't come back. And, and that's where we step in. A few other factors, um, non-native grasses. So um, the, the ag, uh, um, what am I trying to say? The um, uh, agri-life and others, and I'm not blaming them, but they started pushing new wonder uh, grasses starting in the 1950s um, that were supposed to be really good forage for livestock. So things that are familiar to us now, like King Ranch blue stem, now uh, we're actually asked to call it old world blue stem, because uh, I guess it hurt King Ranch's feelings, and um, buffalo grass and these things that actually turned out to be kind of mediocre uh, cattle forage, but um, try and get rid of them. Uh, those um, non-native invasive grass species, they're all over the landscape now. And most of us don't really notice them. Um, but if you're a horned lizard or a quail, you would notice it because for those species, um, it's basically an impenetrable bamboo thicket, those grasses. And there's nothing to eat in them. There's lower diversity and biomass of arthropods. And um, they also um, block out the sun. They shade the ground where these species like open areas. So the non-native grasses may have played a larger role than fire ants, but um, you know we all we all notice fire ants. We don't necessarily notice the non-native grasses. And then finally, um, uh, loss of habitat. So you know during the same time period, we had the rise of industrial agriculture, where you saw 2,000 acre fields of monoculture, cotton or whatever. That's not habitat for lizards. And we also saw um, you know the beginning of the explosion of urbanization, where 
up until the early 80s, for example, um, you, there were still uh, accounts of horned lizards in South Austin. Seems incredible, but South Park Meadows actually used to be a meadows. Um, but if you look at South Austin now, where would you put a horned lizard, right? There is no habitat. It's uh, a lot of high density housing, a lot of roads, a lot of concrete. And the same for San Antonio. You know, I've had people tell me about collecting horned lizards in their yard a mile from the zoo back when they were kids. So what happened? They used to be in all the, the back alleys and the, and the dirt lots and all the things around the neighborhood. And, and I just say, well, when's the last time you saw an alley or a dirt lot in central San Antonio? Like those, those habitats, those little patches are gone and um, so are the lizards. I hope that was helpful. So I just want to loop in real quick. Um, every single animal that we bring in from the wild uh, gets swabbed and genotyped. And then all of the offspring that we produce also get swabbed and genotyped. And uh, this is really helpful for us, one, in tracking uh, who's your daddy on our, our captive born babies. When we release them, uh, that's a tool we can use. We can swab them and um, we can tell from, from what clutch of eggs they came from. Uh, but also, uh, a number of the animals that we have in our breeding colony were surrendered by uh, in, uh, private citizens. So it's not uncommon enough, unfortunately, that um, someone will collect a horned lizard, uh, bring it home, figure out that they don't know how to feed it or that it's illegal to keep them as pets, and then they will uh, contact us or contact a a rescuer somebody and want to hand over their lizard. And uh, it's really important for us to genotype those animals. Um, and this is a perfect example. If you look on the uh, far right of this graph, so, so basically the three colors and each vertical bar is an individual lizard. And the three colors, blue, yellow, and green, represent those three regional genetic groups that I mentioned earlier. So you can see that this is the, all the animals we had at, at the time that I made the slide. Um, almost all of our animals are, are pure South Texas animals. Um, a few animals have a little bit of uh, mixing with West Texas, which doesn't seem too unusual, or from uh, North Texas. But this one guy way over here on the right-hand side, that's straight up North Texas. That animal didn't come from anywhere near um, South Texas. And so what was more than likely what happened is somebody collected the animal in North Texas and, uh, and uh, sort of misrepresented the, the, how, how they wound up with it. Um, interestingly enough, about the same time, uh, Fort Worth Zoo um, sent all their animals off to Dean Williams or their samples and uh, they had an animal that was straight up South Texas. They had been surrendered to them. So we wound up arranging a pr prisoner swap uh, to get that North animal and their breeding colony in the South and ours. Um, I mentioned just now and a little bit earlier um, that we don't really know where that boundary between North and South should be. Um, horned lizards have blinked out in those counties um, that would have been you know, the, the boundary, say from uh, most of Bear County uh, and on north, um, pretty much all the way to DFW, there aren't any horned lizards. So, you know, we can't really use museum specimens to tell us what the genetics of those animals were um, because they're formal and preserved and the DNA is degraded uh, under that type of preservation. So we have to use a, a, a best guess. And um, my sort of arbitrary, de arbitrary delineation uh, is the Colorado River. It's a major geographic barrier for a lot of other organisms. And um, that made it possible for us to sort of bound our uh, research area and our release area and to um, sort of set up territories between ourselves and those who are working with northern animals. So we don't know where that boundary was. And um, the genetic differences, they may matter, um, but they, they might not, especially in, in Central Texas. You know, panhandle animals, they have to deal with long, cold winters where they're not eating or drinking, they're just dormant. South Texas animals, 
they they are observed 12 months of the year. So you might imagine that South Texas animal uh, flopped down to North Texas, wouldn't fare too well, or vice versa. And uh, so we want to avoid mixing at those extremes. Okay, um, our lizard factory, I just want to give you a little update where we are now. We have, um, actually it's a little bit more, but we have a, about three dozen um, adult breeders in our colony right now. And um, like I mentioned earlier, these were all uh, collected by ourselves under permit, or I've got a long list of uh, deputies, uh, subcontract, uh, sub permittees on my permit who are um, uh, uh, allowed to collect corn lizards for us. And then a number of other um, researchers and consultants who have their own permits who provide them from time to time. So we're always looking for more. Um, we recently released 84 offspring of various ages. Uh, the reason why there are various ages is we had reproduction occurring um, before we were ready to release animals. So the first year of our program, for example, uh, we had a, uh, a female brought in who laid 34 eggs the next day. And um, so their daddy's out in the wild somewhere. Um, we were not ready to release 34 lizards. Um, that's not enough. And it takes a lot of prep uh, on site. So we held them back. And as a result, the 84 lizards that we released, um, they included animals that were about three years old. Um, and then as young as four months old. So we had a, a good range of ages there. Um, we finally uh, finished um, raising the money that we need to build a second lab. So that's got to double our capacity. And um, going through the construction plans on building this shipping container lab, um, it was pointed out that we could build two more um, at very little additional cost. So the first lab cost us about 275000 and um, if we want to, want to add two more identical labs, that's um, on the order of 75 to 100,000. So uh, we're, hopefully we're gonna fundraise um, to meet that goal. And um, by doing so, we will be able to quadruple the capacity of our lizard lab. So super exciting. Um, let's see if this video plays. If it doesn't, that's okay. So, well, um, it's lizard porn. So this is basically two of our adult breeders um, going at it. This is a female and uh, the male, and uh, we, we just kind of caught them in an awkward position. Um, but the nice thing about horned lizards, oh, here we go. If, um, if they're ready to go, um, they get right at it. So, you know, within, 10 minutes of putting the male and female together, whether they're going to breed. And um, they really get into it. So enough of that. <laughs> and um, if everything goes well, this is the result of, uh, of uh, mating episodes like that. We'll get a nice clutch of little horned lizard eggs. They're about the size of a jelly bean. Let's see if this will play. So um, this is a fun little uh, animation created by a, um, a videographer who's uh, been working on a, a film about us, about the lizards. Oh, uh, it hung up. I won't take too much time if, uh, if they're not loading. Okay. Um, so fast forward, uh, this is a fresh hatched horned lizard. So you can see, you know, the size varies a little bit, but for the most part, they're no bigger than nickel, right? Really tiny, really defenseless. Um, everything eats them except in our lab we feed the heck out of them and um, we're able to get them up to this size in a year. So it's not the same individual, but this, these two are siblings. So this is an animal from that same clutch a year later. And um, 
you know, that's what a, a healthy diet and loving uh, caretakers will get you. And um, just an example of this is a fully grown adult horned lizard, uh, one of about six months of age, uh, of recent hatching and the egg. You can see there's a, quite a bit of growth that happens in a short period of time. Oops, over down here. And um, I mentioned that we collect from throughout South Texas. And I, I include this photo to show you just the range of color patterns and shades that these animals have. So for the most part, horned lizards, their, their, their background, their color matches the background of the soil uh, where they come from. So if you go down to say the Chaparral WMA, uh, that's on that red sand sheet, you'll see orangish looking lizards. Um, by the same token, if you go out west on the Caliche, you're gonna see these really pale colored lizards and everything in between, but I think it's beautiful. And um, we're really happy to have that diversity in our breeding population because that's what we want to bake into the offspring that we release. Good genetic diversity. So even if there's a small number of individuals that go on to establish that population, um, we're, we know that they're not to be handicapped by being you know, brothers and sisters. So talking about establishing populations, um, over the last four years now, I met with probably a couple of dozen landowners um, in several counties. So the initial site assessment that I do on a pro uh, property, assuming that they have enough acreage, and, and we estimate about 200 to 250 acres is, is a minimum uh, to support a viable population, um, is to use that team's tool, a vegetation map. So I'll, I'll ask the landowner to provide a, a map of the boundary of the property. Um, my friends at Parks and Wildlife um, do the vegetation community assessment, and then we look at how those plant communities uh, and their associated ranks um, map out on that property. So that's a really helpful tool, one, because I can do it 12 months of the year, and it doesn't involve, um, you don't have to drive anywhere. It can all be done uh, at, at your um, workstation. So that's the first sort of uh, test of, of a candidate property. And then the next one is actually going out there and kicking the dirt and taking a close look at what that landscape looks like at ground level. So for example, uh, oftentimes you can see harvest ramp mounds on satellite imagery. They're you know, these big cleared out circular um, spots, but you can't really see fire ramp mounds. And that's important because a few fire ants, you know, low density of fire ants on site, it's not a deal breaker. But um, when you get to these really, really high densities of fire ants, um, even adult lizards aren't going to do well. So we need, we need to know that before we start investing in a property. And that, that investment goes both ways. So um, that, that initial assessment using the vegetation um, data, it gives us a, um, the opportunity to um, not just rank the property, but to look at what those plant communities are and based on what types of uh, vegetation is there, we can make recommendations for either maintaining it or and more often how to improve that to turn it into quality horned lizard habitat. So for example, um, a property might have just too much woody vegetation um, that can be managed by mechanical thinning or uh, non-native invasive grasses uh, that can be managed through prescribed fire. And that way we're not just turning people away, um, we're giving them uh, a prescription um, and a timeline based on each of those, those management activities for um, what it would take to get to X, X amount of horned lizard habitat. And um, you know, there's a, an added benefit here, and I make sure not to promise people that we're gonna put horned lizards on their ranch. One, um, we're just starting out. Um, two, it's, it's um, really expensive and time consuming. I hate to think what each of those 84 lizards cost us to produce, but um, they're not cheap. And, um, and also uh, the demand just far outstrips our capacity. Even if we quadruple the size of our facility, 
uh, we're still not going to be able to to um, satisfy one percent of landowners out there. However, uh, if you manage for horned lizard habitat, you are managing for native biodiversity, and so it really doesn't matter to me. In, in the long run, full disclosure. Um, Horn lizards are my Trojan horse that I used to get in the door and to encourage voluntary conservation management on the part of private landowners. Um, and they're willing to do it for horn lizards. If I make that plea for solitary bees or cave spiders or something like that, um, yeah, they shut the gate. But uh, everybody wants to do something for horn lizards on their ranch. And it turns out managing for horn lizards. Uh, Encouraging horned lizard habitat, it's exactly the same thing as you would do if you were striving just to increase overall native biodiversity. And um, so the result is whether you get horned lizards or not, you're going to get a whole lot out of that kind of management. And um, I'm working with several ranches who are doing that now. So some have been doing it for several years and some are just getting started. Uh, but it's really encouraging to see uh, people rally. Um, behind the horned lizard to do what's right for their land. So uh, a little bit about this first release that we conducted in October. Um, so we released 84 lizards this year because that's how many we had. Um, but the plan is in order to um, bolster that, that population in its beginning is to release 100 lizards a year for three years in a row and then we'll add 25 more lizards every couple of years just to keep that jack diversity high. And so the release site that, that we conducted our first release at, um, it's a 2000 acre ranch in Blanco County. It's been under management for biodiversity since 2006. Um, and uh, we conducted our release in just one part of it, about 275 acres. It um, was extremely high quality horn lizard habitat, and I'll show you that in a minute. One nice thing was the landowner just um, conducted a prescribed burn um, this past winter, and so that particular pasture was uh, just in tip top shape for lizards. And um, one of the things that that burning does is it allows us to identify harvester ants that we might not have seen otherwise. So walking in in about 300 acres of that area um uh we found uh something like i want to say close to 137 harvest ant mounds so that's a great density per acre of harvest ants which are the primary food of the lizards and uh, we also identified around each harvest ant mound um fire ant mounds and we um gps the harvest ant mounds we put flags in all the fire ant mounds. And then I came back in um, spring at, with a, a portable hot water pressure washer and hand treated uh, with injections of, of boiling hot water, um, the fire ant mounds around about 80 of those harvest ants. And the difference was amazing. So follow up visits to, to check on the, uh, the habitat um, ahead of release. In those areas where I treated fire ants, um, I found hardly any, something like, I, I think I walked 50 acres one day and I saw seven fire ant mounds where back in the spring in that same area, I had probably treated um, well over 250. So it, uh, it really helps, but it's, it's one of these, it's non-toxic and fire ants are um, really good reproducers. So we will have to follow up um, with some sort of maintenance treatments, but very encouraging. Okay, um, I wanted to just show you the, the results that I get to look at um, from this um, uh, Teams tool, the vegetation analysis. And uh, this is the, the shaded in area. This is the boundary of the ranch where we conducted our release. So this area here um, is more or less the, um, the pasture where we turned lizards loose. And you can see by the key down below, that's high quality habitat. In fact, half of the ranch is highest quality habitat. And um, uh, the next largest component is, is good habitat. There's very little marginal habitat. And if you look at the, uh, the areas around this ranch, 
it's similar high quality habitat. So I'm not really interested in establishing populations in the middle of you know rich guys ranches um, for their delight and their delight only. The goal of this project is to get horned lizards back on the landscape. And so with a really great starting point like this ranch, uh, we're hoping that we'll establish a viable population. As they grow, they'll spread out into those um, adjoining properties. And so it starts. And um, just if you're not familiar, uh, this is a close up of the red harvest ant. Um, these, these guys are the primary prey of our Texas horned lizards. And um, they're usually associated with the mounds or you'll find horned lizards on the foraging trails. So this is kind of what they're built to eat. Uh, they will eat other things, but this is their number one uh, food preference in the wild. And by comparison, um, here's a harvest ant mound with that nice clean apron around it, very typical. And um, these are fire ant mounds, just if uh, you need a reminder. And uh, just reiterating that um, managing for horned lizards is managing for biodiversity. A lot of people ask me, well, what kind of habitat do they like? You know, what, how do we manage? I said, do you like quail? Yeah. You know what quail habitat looks like? Yeah. They like exactly the same habitat. And um, that's really helpful in uh, conversations with some folks who, you know, they, they really care about managing for game. They'd like to see more quail. Um, they don't really want to take their time to do something else. And when I explain that managing for quail is managing for horned lizards, well, uh, it's game on. So uh, kind of the last chapter of my presentation, um, it's really difficult to detect horned lizards in the wild. So um, probably the reason why we still have horned lizards anywhere is because they're really good at avoiding detection. And in fact, studies have shown that even skilled lizard searchers only find, only find about 10% of the lizards uh, present. So that's problematic if we're trying to um, track our lizards over time and assess how they're doing and, and what's the likelihood of them establishing a population um, because we're visually oriented predators, detectors. Not so for dogs. So most of you have seen the dogs running over your luggage at the airport or at the border or uh, on television sniffing for of survivors or victims of natural disasters, and that's because they have this incredibly fine sense of smell. And uh, we're using that. So we're using this old school technology of a dog instead of radio tracking devices, et cetera, which are expensive, like on the order of $100, $130 a lizard. Uh, they require a technician to go out and, and detect all of those backpacks hoping that the batteries haven't died or the lizard doesn't shed the backpack, et cetera. Um, lizard can't shed its smell. Lizard smells like lizard no matter what, even when they're dormant in winter. So an article came out a couple of years ago in Parks and Wildlife Magazine talking about our project. And I got a phone call shortly thereafter uh, from a gentleman named Paul Bunker, who has a conservation dog training business called Chiron Canine. And um, his bread and butter is um, uh, he has trained dogs and they walk oil and gas uh, pipeline alignments, sniffing for leaks. And um, he wanted to get into something that was more directly conservation related. Saw the article, called me up, asked if he could help. And I said, ha, yes. So um, Paul and I laid out the plans for a um, a conservation uh, horned lizard detection dog network. And basically that involves sourcing dogs um, from kill shelters and animals are selected based on their temperament and their personality. And then um, having a list of volunteers who are willing to provide a forever home for those dogs and to undergo training with their dog to become lizard detection teams. So if you have the dog with the right traits, uh, you can go from zero to a fully deployable lizard detection dog in 45 days. So this is what we set out to do. Um, the first phase of it was to work with a single dog and her owner um, as a pilot project to sort of 
a proof of concept and see see if it was really feasible. And then um, uh, I, I'm happy to say that we're really happy with the um, the results of the pilot study, and we're ready to move on to phase two, which is establishing that network. And um, the benefit there is that. Uh, we're not putting all our eggs in one basket or depending on a single individual and their dog. Uh, we have a sort of call list of people um, to come and help us. Conservation dogs have been used um, for a lot of other species in the past. And in almost every, um, in almost every case, they failed not because of the dog. So our first lizard detection dog is Gren. And uh, here's Gren working in the field. Um, so what the train, what the handler and the dog do is the handler picks a direction and she has the dog doing about 50 yard sweeps in front of her from left to right. When the dog finds that target scent, she'll give a cue. She either sits down or she lies down next to the thing, usually with it right between her legs. And um, they can find things that we never would. So for example, when we were out with her a few weeks ago, um, she had a hard cue on something and we scoured the ground and looked all over and couldn't find a lizard, couldn't find scat. And we ran her through there two more times. And every time she sat down at the same spot saying there was a lizard here. So it's probably a very small scat and it uh, was before the rain. But, um, very promising that the dog can, can do that. And under the right conditions, the dog can, can handle um, between 50 and 200 acres a day. So a little bit of training. What we're doing is, yeah, we're doing stuff. And uh, whatever the target is, it'll be somewhere under her chest between her elbows. And that's she's sort of telling us right go. where it is. And um, here's an example of a scat that she found in the wild. So um, she's sitting down queuing on this little object right here. And that's a, a very, uh, Typical horned lizard scat, they're really distinctive, uh, mostly because they're made up of all ant body parts. And then they have this old clump of urate on the end. So um, I just want to thank all of the um, uh, grant providers and individuals who made donations to this program, um, not least of which is Texas Parks and Wildlife. So we had to run out and get our horned lizard license plate, um, thanks to them. And uh, this project is entirely funded by grants and donations. So it really means a lot that, um, you know, people have, have stepped up and shown how much they love the species and want it back to allow us to try and carry that out. Yes, thank you so much, Andy. And there's that webpage that, that you're gonna post. Thanks. Yes, great. We put that in the, um, that website is in the chat uh, for you to explore that more. Um, Andy, thanks so much. We have a couple of questions. Um, sure. One is um, from Bill talking about those differences in the Western, Southern, Northern groups. Um, would the extensive limestone outcroppings of the Edwards Plateau also be a barrier between North and South populations? Uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they were never really abundant in the Edwards Plateau, but um, like most places, they're sort of patchily distributed. So historically, there were areas with a fair number of horned lizards, and then large expanses where there are no records of horned lizards. And um, a lot of that has to do with that soil type. And that soil type, um, you know, the vegetation um, uh, communities that we use is a good proxy for soil type and slope and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, there are spots like Mason County, for example, where there are horned lizards today, but a lot of that county is this uh, gr granitic outcrop, and um, there's just not really great horned lizard habitat, but they still persist where there's good habitat there. And then um, from Jim, are there any sites in the BCP or WQPL that would be appropriate for them? And Bill, who's a biologist with BCP, chimed in, if deep sandy soils needed little opportunity, there might be little opportunity on the BCP since most is thin and clay. And Kevin, who's the program manager for the WQPL, mentioned that quail have been found on all um, of the WQPL lands that we own outright as the city, so it's possible. Um, but I wanted to get your take on that. That's what um, we were secretly hoping for, Andy, as we rush yeah. you to jump on Zoom and rush you to finish the time for questions. 
Well, really, we all just want I'm to learn glad you brought it up because I was going to, uh, so I realized I've run a bit long. But um, sandy soils aren't absolutely required. Uh, look at the places where horned lizards occur. Yeah, they like sandy soils, but you know they live in caliche and all sorts of other stuff. So um, that's not required. Um, the fact that they're quail on several of these properties, that's a great sign that the necessary components are in place. And uh, yeah, I live, you know, two miles away from uh, from 5,000 acres of uh, city property that looks like tremendous habitat. In addition, you know, the city manages that, right? So, you know, prescribed fire, thinning, maintaining a native plant community, and, and taking care of that ecosystem, not just for uh, the watershed. Um, we already have good stewardship in place. I wouldn't need to tell city folks uh, or C city of Austin um, how to manage their property for biodiversity. So um, I think it'd be great not to mention um, I want them close to home. I want a, I want a 5,000 acre release area five minutes from my house and um, if things like the uh, the um, green belt project and stuff uh, continue along uh, that'd be an opportunity for many many people to see a horned lizard in the wild just like grandpa did so yeah i'm all over it kevin bill uh let's talk great and then cheryl has what's our last question right now um which is um what's the current population like in big bend uh well big bend has two species actually um but with texas horned lizards as far as um as i understand they're stable so they're, they're out there. I see them when I'm in the um, Trans-Pecos in the Big Bend region, uh, pretty much every trip if I'm in the right season. So um, they're, they're pretty stable, but look at Big Bend. You know, the, the threats that we talked about earlier, they're not present. Great. Um, and then that's, that's the last one besides Kevin's comment of rock on Andy um, in response <laughs> to <laughs> um, WQPL. And yeah, just to folks um, voicing some appreciation for such an uplifting story. It is really um, motivating and so cool to think about uh, a new, you know, generations of, of folks getting excited about nature and conservation through um, interactions with Texas horn lizards, hopefully across Texas. Well, thank you for the opportunity and um, thank you volunteers.